Welcome everyone to our third Parked at Home uh, winter discussion. Uh, we're very excited to have you all here with us uh, this week. Uh, we have what should be a very lively and engaging discussion uh, this week. Um, just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded uh, and it's being recorded so that way it can be posted on the Parks YouTube channel. Uh, so if you do miss any of uh, the weeks of these discussions, you can always go back. Or if you really want to rewatch tonight's discussion, you can always go back and rewatch the discussion there um, when it will be posted to the Parks YouTube page. We encourage folks to continue. Uh, we've got some really great answers already in the chat. Ulysses S. Grant, Tim, I tend to agree with you. Uh, John Q, uh, Calvin Coolidge, some really interesting uh, answers in the chat. We encourage folks to continue to participate uh, by typing your questions and comments into the chat throughout the uh, discussion. We just ask that everybody remain on mute for the formal part of our discussion tonight. It just cuts down on the background noise and cuts out any interruptions. Uh, we will have an opportunity after our formal discussion ends tonight uh, for an extended version of our discussion uh, for an extra 15 minutes, which can be much more informal. Folks can unmute themselves and we can have a more informal conversation. If you do have any technical issues tonight, I am joined by my colleague, Jill Forrester. Uh, if you do have any issues, feel free to direct message Jill and she'll be able to help you through any of those technical issues. Tonight, we are discussing uh, the presidents of the United States, specifically one of the presidents of the United States. Um, but uh, we have had 46 presidents uh, over the course of our 235 year history since the creation of the office of president 235 years ago with the US Constitution. Technically 45 different individuals, thanks a lot Grover Cleveland uh, for having a split term, but these 45 individuals that have held the office of president of the United States. There are 21 National Park Service sites that preserve birthplaces, homes or headquarters of US presidents, for example, Herbert Hoover National Historic Site in Iowa, and 11 additional sites that preserve monuments and memorials to U.S. presidents, like Mount Rushmore. Tonight, we are joined by one of those 21 sites, uh, Eisenhower National Historic Site in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. But if you're not familiar with the Blackstone River Valley in our National Historical Park here, um, on your screen, you will see a map uh, that denotes these six different sites that make up Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. Each one of these six unique sites helps to tell that story of the Blackstone River Valley here in Rhode Island and Massachusetts as this incubator and beginning point of the American Industrial Revolution. And we do have uh, quite a few connections with US presidents here in the Blackstone River Valley. President Andrew Jackson will visit Slater Mill, one of our six sites in the 1830s, and will tour the grounds with a future president, at that time his vice president, Martin Van Buren. William Howard Taft, part of his family, grew up in Millbury, Massachusetts, here in the Blackstone River Valley. So just two examples of connections that we have with U.S. presidents here in the Blackstone. But um, our president of choice for tonight, Dwight D. Eisenhower also has a really interesting connection with the valley. Here on this slide uh, is uh, the, um, uh, the front page of the Boston Daily Globe in which uh, from October 21st, 1952, and it's talking about a specific visit that Ike makes to Providence, Rhode Island and other spots in the Blackstone River Valley. But specifically here pictured on this front page is an image from just outside of Providence City Hall. And in that speech, um, then candidate for the presidency, Dwight D. Eisenhower, in October of 1952, just before the election in November, is going to, uh, quote, call upon his comrades who have worn the uniform in the past to support him, asking, who do you suppose hates war more than you do, end quote. That is an interesting thing for a soon-to-be president, former five-star general, commander of Allied forces during World War II, to say. Um, and he's saying this uh, in reaction to some criticism that he's coming under for his stance on the Korean War and the thought that he is an isolationist um, and does not want to combat communism on the global stage here. 
But uh, what better way to segue into our discussion tonight? Because as we talk about Eisenhower National Historic Site and the Valley's relationship with industry and war industry specifically, um, we are really excited to welcome uh, 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 this specific person, though, to our discussion tonight. Um, many of you know him, especially if you've been around the Blackstone River Valley for any time. Um, we are joined tonight by Supervisory Park Ranger Joshua Bell from Eisenhower National Historic Site. Josh, uh, similar to Lauren last week, is an alumnus, if you will, of Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. Jo Josh worked with us for years. Uh, he is a very close friend um, and colleague. Uh, and I uh, added a, another picture here to our slideshow that I think sums up quite well Josh and I's relationship. Uh, this taken on a walkabout in Slatersville a few years ago. Uh, myself, a, a younger, not quite as sleep deprived uh, uh, father um, at that time, um, about to say something and Josh kind of tentatively staring at me, not knowing what is about to come out of my mouth next. And I don't think that there is a picture that better describes our relationship. But uh, Josh, very, fair. very honored uh, that you have decided to join us tonight. Um, and so to get us started, uh, could you tell us a little bit about Eisenhower National Historic Site and what the national, that National Park Service site is all about? Sure, I just wanna take a minute to thank you for having me uh, back along the Blackstone with everybody. Um, it, it's nice to be home uh, in, in some small way. Uh, that, that looked like a Jim Hendrickson picture, is that? It was, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I see I see some familiar names here um, on the on the Zoom tonight. So greetings. Um, so Eisenhower National Historic Site um, is the uh, preserved home of President and Mrs. Eisenhower. It is the only home that uh, the two of them ever owned together. And they didn't end up buying this thing until Eisenhower retired from the military or was about to retire from the military. Um, in the 1950s. Uh, he purchased a 189-acre uh, farm out in lovely Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, um, not far uh, from that other national park that's in town, Gettysburg National Military Park, slightly more uh, renowned than perhaps Eisenhower in some ways, uh, but we like to think of them as the other park. Um, much love to our, our friends across the street. Um, Eisenhower, when he purchased this farm, he wanted to buy a piece of land that he could leave better than he found it. And here's, here's a great picture of the home. Uh, the original farmhouse that they purchased um, in 1950, they were thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to, you know, we can't wait to move in. Um, but as they found out, um, what they thought they purchased, would, which uh, they thought they purchased an old farmhouse that was constructed in the 18, mid 1800s. And it turns out, uh, that the original framework was from before that, so they had to gut it and build out um, and totally remodel. So most of the home is 1950s construction, um, and much to their satisfaction um, in their in their in their public service years um, as, as with Eisenhower being president, and uh, in their retirement as well. And you can see the sunroom uh, with the the windows, uh, and that was Eisenhower's favorite spot to sit was in that sunroom. But uh, we preserve the history and legacy of, of Eisenhower's presidency um, and his careers in public service. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Um, and so to get us started, um, we have this kind of ominous slide here that says Ike's warning on it. Uh, to introduce this theme of war and peace and Ike's relationship with those two things and the Valley's relationship with those two things. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this very famous quote that Ike is going to uh, state at the end of his presidency? Sure. So, so Eisenhower, you know, the five-star uh, general, uh, the supreme commander of allied forces uh, in Europe during World War II, um, he says that um, at the end of his presidency, he says, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for this disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Now, this is a very peculiar thing for, for a man of his stature uh, to be saying, but this is perhaps one of the most famous utterances uh, that he makes while he is in office and perhaps during his entire life. Um, this is one of those lines that um, 
that resonates with us that's part of our our heritage and um tonight i think we're going to poke around a little bit and see where where that comes from uh this big military man uh and his story awesome thank you josh uh, and so to get started um i'm going to provide us a little perspective on the Blackstone River Valley's uh, involvement in wartime productions during times of war and how that production and this kind of a pattern that we see evolving in uh, the 19th and early 20th century uh, is markedly different than by the time that President Eisenhower uh, utters that very famous quote uh, in 1961. Uh, so in order to demonstrate what the typical pattern of the relationship between industry and war was, I'm going to choose two specific examples. And that's the example of the American Civil War and World War II. I'll talk about World War II a little bit later after we introduce Eisenhower's early years. But first, uh, to demonstrate with the Civil War, there are these general themes uh, that evolve when it comes to this relationship with industry and war uh, that we see in the Blackstone River Valley. And that is the ability to adapt the industrial processes that existed in mills to produce war materials during the war years. And then once those wars ended, to revert back to what they were producing prior to that. So it's this uh, uh, they're producing peacetime materials, this build up to wartime materials, high production of wartime materials, and then this return at the end of the war is really what we see again and again, whether it's the American Civil War, World War I, or World War II. Uh, so we'll start here with the American Civil War. And I have here four different images which demonstrate that ability, that adaptability of industry in the Blackstone River Valley and the ability to adapt production to produce war materials. The center left photo that you see at the top of this slide is of the hilt of a US cavalry, cavalry saber. Um, and if you look closely, stamped just above where the handle is, is uh, Mansfield and Lamb Forestdale, Rhode Island. The Mansfield and Lamb uh, scythe shop manufactured scythes and later other forms of tools in Forestdale starting in 1824. And so when we talk about the park and all of our different locations, one of our locations is Slatersville. Just adjacent, just down the Branch River from Slatersville is Forestdale. And in Forestdale, there was the Mansfield and Lamb Company, and they are producing these scythes that are being used to process agricultural goods, to harvest crops. During the time of the Civil War, right, it shouldn't surprise us that a metal blade with a sharp edge could be adapted to the production of sabers during the time of the war. And so Mansfield and Lamb will adapt their operations to produce sabers for the U.S. Army during the war. At the end of the war, primarily, they will revert back to the tools and other scythes and, scythes and other tools that they were producing prior to the war. So build up, making a whole bunch of a war material, in this case, sabers, and then reverting to what they produced before. On the left side of your screen here, the far left is an image of the Providence Tool Company. And the Providence Tool Company... Um, they're machining tools. They're uh, these laborers and machinists who are working there. During the Civil War, they are going to get a uh, they're going to get a contract for the production of Springfield rifled muskets. So they're going to go from producing tools at the Providence Tools Company to producing these Springfield rifled muskets, one of the most commonly used musket during the American Civil War by the Union Army, by US forces during the Civil War. They're gonna produce 70,000 of these by war's end. And then when the war ends, they don't stay solely in arms production. They're gonna revert back to what they were producing before the war. The center right, uh, photo that you see here is of the USS Monitor. We see two uh, naval officers standing on the deck of the Monitor and that very famous turret that sat on the top of the Monitor's deck. That turret with the two cannons inside of it could rotate 360 degrees. And that took some ingenuity and innovation to design a gear that could support that massive turret and could turn 360 degrees. 
Well, the Corliss Steam Engine Company is the one that is going to invent that in Providence. So the production of that gear that, again, would be used again and again um, in the production of monitor-style uh, naval vessels. And then on the far right here, this image of a young Union soldier who's wearing this kind of shiny cape-looking thing over his shoulders. Uh, what he's wearing there is what would be called a gum blanket or a gummy blanket a piece of canvas with vulcanized rubber on one side. And that is basically more or less waterproof. So what you're looking at there is a poncho, a nice blanket, something that a soldier could wrap up in to keep themselves dry and warm when the weather wasn't nice out. Uh, those are produced, not solely, but the Winsocket Rubber Company produces thousands of those gum blankets that are used by the Union Army during the American Civil War. So we see here four distinct examples of these companies that are not in war production, that adapt their operations to produce mass produce war materials during the war years, and then revert back to what they were producing before at the end of the war. We're going to see a very similar thing happen in World War II. But before we get there, Josh, um, I understand that the American Civil War and the veterans of that war had a pretty heavy effect on Eisenhower, a young Eisenhower, uh, and his experiences. So could you uh, introduce us to who Dwight D. Eisenhower was, uh, what his early life was like, uh, and take us right up through World War II? Sure. So uh, Dwight David Eisenhower was born uh, in Texas, raised in Kansas to a very uh, family of incredibly modest means. Um, and as a child, uh, he was a big student of history, uh, to the point where his mom would have to hide his history books on him. So he would go do his chores. Um, probably not Mark, you're shaking your head. <laughs> poor decision, poor decision. Never hide history books. Um, so he, he's having the history books hit on him, but he's also doing something else. I saw Teddy Roosevelt mentioned in the chat. Uh, when Ike was growing up, Teddy Roosevelt was storming up San Juan Hill with the Rough Riders, and Ike and his brothers would reenact. Um, they would, when they were playing outside, they would reenact Teddy Roosevelt's charge up San Juan Hill. Um, these are kids uh, who were immersed in history uh, much the same way that the rest of us are. We have veterans all around us who fought in the last war um, and, and previous. Uh, so Eisenhower as he's you know, bopping around town as a kid, is bumping into all these Civil War veterans. And he's hearing their stories and he's finding this completely fascinating. And uh, he decides that he wants to further his education. And the best way to do that is to head off to one of the, um, the service schools. So he applies to West Point and is accepted. This does cause a little bit of a, uh, friction in the house. Uh, Eisenhower's parents, and Eisenhower belonged to kind of the River Brethren, uh, which is kind of, if, if you think loosely, uh, Mennonite tradition uh, for their faith. And they are 100% pacifists. So Ike's parents um, who brought him up quoting scripture, uh, reading the Bible at home, these, they're, they're slightly disappointed that their kid's gonna head off to, to join one of the military service uh, academies. So this is where Eisenhower is, is coming from. Uh, and Eisenhower that we see here, uh, he is a major at that point. That's after he spends uh, some time here in Gettysburg as the commander of um, Camp Colt, which is the first tank training facility here in the United States. It was actually out on the battlefield. If you can imagine uh, some, some guys out there with uh, some French and British tanks using big round top as a backstop for their firing exercises. Eventually the National Park Service comes along and you know we put the kibosh on the War Department or the Army for, from doing any of that stuff. Um, the, the Eisenhower we see here, uh, he is ready to head off onto a convoy, uh, make a convoy across the United States from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, with military personnel. And in doing so, he learns that it takes 60 days to cross the United States. This is a, this is a long time if you need to defend, uh, defend your territory. And perhaps that prompts an idea for him later on when he becomes president in the form of the interstate highway system as a way to connect us all together. 
Uh, but he's learning a couple of things. So at Camp Colt, he's learning how to train people. At, for the military convoy, he's dealing with logistics. They're breaking down. They have to figure out how to navigate across the country without you know, quality roads. Um, Eisenhower thought because he did not see combat, that his career, combat in World War I, uh, when he was at uh, Camp Colt, that his military career was over. Um, he does get to go to France, however. He goes with the American Battle Monuments Commission and serves as the kind of official historian. He writes the guidebooks to all the battles that happened um, on the Western Front um, in, in France. And this, this information kind of comes in handy a little bit later on. But he's gaining all this knowledge, all these skills. Uh, he gets to see war from a 30,000 foot view instead of from inside a trench. And that kind of changes his perspective on how to fight wars. Um, if he had been there um, in the trenches with other guys, who knows what his perspective would have been uh, otherwise. And he also gets to deal uh, at some point with big personalities. I'm going to mention a name and I want to, I want to see what people think uh, here in the chat. If you could, um, if you've heard of General Douglas MacArthur, uh, if you could drop in the chat a word or two about what you, how you perceive uh, Douglas MacArthur, what, what comes to mind um, when, when thinking of, of that general and and his role in the in the world that we live in today. If anybody has any thoughts, we'll be we'll be watching over there. Um, Eisenhower is one of those larger than life kind of personnel. I will return. Yes, yes. Trouble says Andrew Andy Schnetzer. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, a hawk. Yes. Yes, Tim. Um, One hundred percent um, hawkish. He was, he was one of those big, difficult personalities. And I think Gregory Peck really captured him uh, in the pictures. And Eisenhower gets to go work for him as his chief of staff. Ike had the job of keeping MacArthur in line in the Philippines in the late 19, in the 1930s. And um, you, you learn a lot. Eisenhower said of that experience that he got a second degree in theatrics uh, working, working for MacArthur. And MacArthur later quipped that Ike was the best clerk he ever had. Um, so that kind of illustrates their relationship. But all of these things are coming together. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Mark, um, we'll see that in 1941, the United States gets dragged into World War II uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. There had been some appetite for this among some Americans. Some Americans wanted to get involved. FDR wanted to get involved. Other Americans, more isolationists, uh, those who identified with the America First movement at that time said, this isn't our problem uh, until Pearl, Pearl Harbor is attacked. Um, and then, then there's a, a rallying around um, a war effort um, by, by the vast majority of Americans. Eisenhower is recalled to Washington where he helps plan, um, make some more plans uh, for the Philippines actually, and, and, and draft, drafts a plan that's successful and is adopted um, by Marshall, General George Marshall, his boss uh, at the War Department in the Army. And uh, in 1943, they go, on, they go on maneuvers. So Eisenhower is given a team of, of soldiers and another general is given a team of soldiers. And the idea is they do a mock battle. And this happens in Louisiana. And Ike does such a good job that in 1943, December 1943, FDR handpicks uh, Eisenhower to be the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces for the invasion of Normandy, of Northern France. Uh, Operation Overlord, D-Day, uh, as we've come to know it. Um, so he's done all this without any traditional combat experience. So this, this kid, this young officer who was a captain here in Gettysburg, um, at the end of World War, or at the end of World War One, thinking his career is over, is now in charge of perhaps the most significant operation, uh, military operation of the 20th century. And uh, over the course of the war, here we, yeah, here's Eisenhower. Um, I mentioned D-Day. This is Eisenhower speaking to some airborne troops right before, um, right before they get ready to to jump. Um, the day, the, the evening before D-Day, and it looks like he's giving them like a big pep, a pep talk. He's like building them up and, you know, trying to, trying to improve the esprit de corps, but what he's really doing is talking to them individually about where they're from, and here he's talking about fly fishing. Um, so he's talking about home with these guys, and he knows that many of these young men are not going to survive the jump. They're not going to survive the first hour. 
they're not going to survive the first day of combat. He knows many of these men. He His plan um, that he has put in place, uh, that he knows that that plan is going to lead to the death of many of these uh, young American men. And that, that weighs on him. Um, as the war progresses, uh, we also see, uh, Mark, if we go to the next slide, um, more of the cost of war. This is Cologne, Germany. Um, Allied bombing uh, destroys, uh, destroys Cologne and many other cities uh, and towns in Germany. And this, of course, leads to a rise in homelessness, this re uh, and, and hunger, and you know, being exposed to the elements. And you know, there's, there's a very human cost to this war. Um, and once the Allied invasion of, of northern France is successful, and once we start to push into Germany, we of course uncover the the horrors of the Holocaust, um, where six million Jews are, are murdered, and five million others uh, are also murdered. So you have. Germans with disabilities falling into, falling into that other category, communists, socialists, uh, Soviet POWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, people that are found undesirable by the Nazi party um, have all been murdered. So uh, Eisenhower sees this. Um, and when they liberate one of the camps, uh, he says, well, we need to make sure that this, this is recorded because if we don't record this, people are gonna say this didn't happen. Um, we must preserve this for posterity. Uh, we must look at, um, how do we prevent this going forward? So he makes the locals bury the dead. He makes the locals tour the camps. He takes Patton through one of the camps and Patton can't go into one of the rooms where there are a bunch of bodies uh, because he says he was gonna be, he was physically ill. I was going to be sick if he went in there and, and saw it for himself. Um, but over the course of the war, um, we see a, a lot of death and destruction and the toll of, of, um, toll of the war on a, on a very human level. Mark, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we see the, the two mushroom clouds from the two atomic weapons that were dropped during World War II on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, uh, killing uh, tens, and thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, instantly and, and through radiation sickness. Um, Eisenhower thought this was a terrible, not, a ter not necessarily a terrible decision, but a terrible toll. Again, he's thinking about the cost of war in these human terms. Um, over the course of the war, we see between 70 and 100 million deaths of, of soldiers and civilians alike, depending on uh, which, which numbers uh, you lean on. And here we have uh, crosses and stars of, uh, stars of David um, in Manila, you know, in Manila in the Philippines. These are, this is an American cemetery. They're part of the American Battle Monuments Commission today. Um, and it's, it's a reminder that um, this is where Eisenhower started, uh, started his World War II work. And if we go to no the next slide, we'll see North Africa, American soldiers buried in North Africa. Eisenhower was instrumental in Operation Torch. Um, all these young men, and if we go one more slide, um, we, we head to Normandy here, the beaches of Normandy. And it's possible that, you know, men who were in that picture of Eisenhower going like this and talking to them, they could be interred there. Um, Eisenhower is, is keenly aware of this cost, not just in a sense of numbers, but in the sense of families being broken, uh, destroyed, and in, in many cases, families not being started. Uh, these young men never had children, many of them. They would never get to see what it was like to have children or grandchildren. And for Eisenhower, this, this set very deeply um, with him. Over the course of the war, 416,000 American service members died, um, which, is, which is very significant, um, but certainly not, a, a, you know, ju it's just a small fraction of the overall total. Um, Mark, can we go to the next slide? So thank you, Josh, um, for that overview of uh, the war, Ike's early life, the cost of the war, certainly uh, the sacrifices that were made by U.S. men and women in uh, the service. Um, and there were sacrifices certainly made on the home front, too, here in the Valley. Um, we're going to talk once again about how industry adapted, but I think it's always important to note that 
You know, we say, oh, this company made this or that company made that. And in reality, the companies didn't make anything. It was the laborers, the people who worked in those mills who were actually crafting these products, which were used by the war effort. Uh, and so we should never lose sight of the fact that these are oftentimes uh, women who are working in these mills, men and women, um, who are working in these mills, who are laboring in these mills, who are producing these products, which are aiding the war effort. And they made sacrifices themselves too, not on the battlefields, um, but making sacrifices in the mills back home here to produce these weapons and to produce other products. Um, but what we see here in the Blackstone River Valley, again, uh, when we're looking for patterns, right, those bigger picture patterns across time, we see the same exact thing that we saw during the American Civil War that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation happening during World War II. Many of these companies are not producing war materials, and yet they adapt to new production styles, new types of things that they're making, and mass produce these war materials for war. And then after the war, typically return back to normal production of peacetime materials. Uh, what we see here on this slide is an image of a ghost army tank. Uh, Josh talked a little bit about Operation Overlord and the invasion at Normandy. Well, a huge part of Operation Overlord and the Normandy invasion is this deception campaign that the Allied forces undergo to try to uh, deceive the Germans as to where this landing is going to happen. And this entire Hollywood set basically is built across from Calais, Calais um, instead of Normandy to try to make it look like um, the U.S. Army is going to land in Calais rather than at Normandy. Uh, tanks, rubber tanks, like the one that we see pictured here, were made in by the U.S. Rubber Company, a later adaptation of the Woonsocket Rubber Company, uh, in Woonsocket at the Alice Mills. Uh, rubber tanks, Jeeps, and other vehicles were made there in this mill as part of this ghost army. So before the war, right, uh, the U.S. Rubber Company was not making fake tanks out of rubber but they're adapting their operations to mass produce war materials for a very specific war in a very specific time. Uh, they are also producing many of the life jackets that are used on naval vessels, US naval vessels throughout the course of World War II. Um, here, we see the Ashton Mill pictured on your screen. Uh, and I love this picture, not that it's from World War II, it's a little bit earlier than World War II, but I love this picture of Ashton Mill with the locomotive going down the track right in front of it. On um, the Ashton Mill, right prior to World War II lays vacant. The Lonsdale Company has sold its interest in the mill, it's laying vacant. Owens Corning Corporation comes in and purchases the mill in the early 1940s. And they start to produce fiberglass in the mill. And they are going to produce fiberglass that is going to go towards uh, the production of airplanes and uh, naval vessels in the Civil War. They're going to produce so much fiberglass for this war cause that they're going to win the coveted uh, Army Navy E Award for production. Again, Owens Corning is not in the business of just producing fiberglass for the U.S. military, but they're adapting their operations um, during wartime to produce that specific product. And after war, they'll revert back to the production of other goods, uh, things that they would have uh, produced otherwise, fiberglass curtains and other products that they would have made. The White and Machine Works is another great example, another one of our National Park Service sites here in the Blackstone River Valley. The White and Machine Works is making the textile machines that's being used in, textile, in the textile industry at that point, not just domestically, but even internationally. But a key point to the White and Machine Works is they have this foundry on site. And during the war, they're going to be subcontracted sub to produce a Liberty ship type engines. So they go from producing textile machines to producing engines for a certain type of naval vessel during World War II. Again, adapting their production because of the war and the need for a certain type of material during the war. To stay on the theme of Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park sites, we see here a picture of the Draper Corporation, uh, Draper Mill in Hopedale. Uh, they are, of course, renowned, the Drapers, for the production at this point of uh, textile looms. But during the war, they're going to adapt 
and they're going to start to, as part of what they're producing here, produce what you see on the upper left-hand corner of the slide, 75 millimeter howitzers for the U.S. Army. And so, and they're not going to continue indefinitely producing these howitzers for the U.S. Army. When the war ends, they're going to transition back to what they would have produced before the war. So again, we see these industries adapting, producing war materials, and then returning to what they produced before. And this pattern happens again and again and again in the Blackstone River Valley. However, by the end of World War II, by the time of Eisenhower's presidency, things are changing, not just on a global stage, but also on a domestic stage. So Josh, can you fill us in on what is happening in this changing world as uh, we move into the post-war years with Eisenhower? Sure. Uh, so uh, although uh, the war is over, um, a couple of things to, to, to keep in mind here. Pearl Har the, the trauma caused by Pearl Harbor, I don't think, can be uh, overstated. Uh, the fact that the, nat that, uh, the nation got taken off guard uh, is, is something that sits with the American people. It is, is deeply seated, um, and there's this desire to not ever let it happen again. And we also have happening uh, concurrently with that um, the rise of the Soviet Union, our former ally. Um, in World War II, uh, perhaps the most the most casualties of any of our allies, um, you know, they have taken advantage uh, in certain areas in Germany uh, and in Berlin. There's some some tensions. Uh, Berlin is split. Uh, Germany is split, and there's concern among not only the American people, but also among, specifically among military folks, that something bad is going to happen and that we have to be prepared uh, for that reality. Uh, in 1946, Eisenhower is named chief of staff of the army uh, and works out of the Pentagon, pictured here, and he sees all of this uh, kind of unfolding before him. And he understands He's starting to understand this constantly changing world. He knows that it's not going to go back to the way it was beforehand. Um, the world has significantly moved and things are now different. Um, and we also have, I mentioned them before, the Soviet aggression um, in unstable and destabilized parts of the world, the division in Germany, uh, Berlin in particular, and former colonies um, of, of other of other European uh, nations. Uh, Mark, if we go to the next slide here, uh, we'll see, I think we'll see him. We'll get to see a picture of the, oh, um, I've skipped I have skipped my slide here. Um, also in 1946, we have uh, the H-bomb, uh, the hydrogen bomb um, test in the Pacific and Bikini Islands. The bomb uh, that they've detonated here is 100 to 1,000 times deadlier than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All under Eisenhower's watch as um, the as the chief of staff to, uh, of the army. And Mark, if we go to the next slide, it's interesting here. Yes, that is a cake. Um, your eyes are not deceiving you. So there's this, in some circles, celebration of this new mega weapon. Um, I'm not sure if Eisenhower would have celebrated at this point. I think that, um, that this is helping inform his opinion of how, how events are unfolding. Uh, we have military leaders celebrating this, this massive new weapon. And, and what does that mean for our nation? So these are questions that I think are starting to form in Eisenhower's mind. And if we go to the next slide, um, all of this in 1946 in the face of Joseph Stalin, um, the, I'm going to make sure I get his title right, um, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Soviet Union, um, which is an awful big mouthful. Um, Joseph Stalin uh, kind of has this aggressive attitude, and one of the reasons that's given for Harry Truman uh, dropping the bomb historically is that he wanted to let the Soviet Union know that we had them, um, even though we used up both of them 
uh, on Japan, but that we had the technology to do such a thing and that perhaps Stalin should think twice before maneuvering himself um, into parts of the world that we would consider the free part of the world um, that aren't living under the authoritarian rule um, of comrade Stalin. Uh, so if we, if we go from 1946, uh, we get to 1950, if we skip ahead a little bit, um, with Stalin's permission, uh, under Harry Truman's administration, with Stalin's permission, uh, Kim Il-sung of North, what is now North Korea, uh, attacks the, the small D democratic um, neighbors to the South and the Korean War starts in the summer of 1950. Um, with with uh, Stalin's backing. Ike, Ike is now thinking about retirement and he and Mamie come up here to Gettysburg and they see this lovely little farmhouse and they think, oh my goodness, yes, this is exactly what we wanted. Ike had written Mamie during World War II and said, let's, let's find a little farmhouse. Can you, can you just imagine it? You and me out on a farm, having a nice time. And they finally found one. And they found it in a place that Eisenhower loved. He loved it because of its history, its proximity to Washington, D.C. and New York. Um, Ike had been serving as president of Columbia University um, for a few years, and they were, they were seriously considering. I mean, 37 years and 37 moves uh, is pretty significant, and that's what poor Mamie had to endure, um, leaving her life of, of relative luxury as the daughter of a millionaire to attach herself to this young army officer at the time in the 19 teens when they, uh, when they got married. But the Eisenhowers don't get to retire to Gettysburg, not right away. Uh, two weeks after they sign the paperwork and put a down payment on the house, Harry Truman, president of the United States, calls up Eisenhower and asks him to serve again. He says, you are the consensus candidate to be our commander of NATO forces. We need you in charge of NATO in Europe, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And Eisenhower wouldn't be Eisenhower if he had done anything but said, yes, sir. Um, Eisenhower was about duty and service, and he took the, the stars on his shoulders incredibly seriously and agrees to serve and postpone uh, his retirement. So he and Mamie head off to France for two years. And if we go to the next slide, Mark. Uh, in those two years, um, while Ike is over in Korea or over in uh, France, the Korean War drying, grinds to a stalemate, uh, right around the 38th parallel. And Ike's looking around at the world, and there are people back home who are saying, you know, maybe Ike should be president. Nobody knew what political party he belonged to. He didn't have an affiliation. He'd never voted before. Um, and he decides, I'm going to run for president. And uh, he decides that in the face of uh, potential isolationist Robert Taft, son of President Taft, and his old boss, General MacArthur, potentially running and getting elected as president. So Eisenhower takes up the mantle with popular support and gets elected. Uh, Ike, the general, the war hero, once he takes charge in the Oval Office, he goes from waging war to waging peace. And arguably, that's much harder to do. Um, from, from the perspective of the American people uh, or from you know, the, those who are interested in the political aspects of things, it requires a trusted negotiator, uh, someone who fosters and embodies our national values, uh, someone who won't sell us out um, or give, unfavorable, give more favorable terms to another nation instead of our own, um, and someone who can command respect, and also someone who understands the nuance of international diplomacy and rallying people to a common cause. And they found their guy in Eisenhower. Uh, in March of 1953, uh, an opportunity opens. Comrade Stalin dies. And Eisenhower gives a chance, uh, a speech called the Chance for Peace, where he invokes the spirit of 45 uh, when the Soviets were allies. And he talks about how everybody worked cooperatively to fight the fascists. Um, and that he, he acknowledges the past eight years under Stalin's leadership uh, between the end of World War II and the present time, but he invites them to uh, engage in a new world, in a new vision for a world. And in that speech, he says, every, he says, uh, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed, 
the world in arms is spending is not spending money alone. So again, recalling the witness that he has for World War II, the human cost of war. Um, and he also in, uh, goes on to say, the monuments of this new kind of war would be these. And he's talking about you know, what waging peace would look like. This new kind of war uh, would lead to roads and schools, hospitals and homes, food and health. So not exactly the talk you expect to hear from a, a big time general. Uh, and this, this outlook kind of coalesces um, in his program called A New Look, which calls for disarmament, global disarmament. And how do we get there? The United States kind of has to take the first step. Uh, so he takes, uh, takes steps to reduce our conventional forces. That's regular soldiers and sailors and Marines. Um, Eisenhower works to end, bring an end or at least a, a cessation of fire uh, or a cessation of hostilities in the Korean War. The armistice still holds today, and this July will celebrate the 70th anniversary of that uneasy peace that Eisenhower helped um, to obtain. And when, when the hostilities end in Korea, the budget uh, for the Department of Defense goes from, in today's dollars, roughly $525 billion to $400 billion. I don't think we can imagine such a slash like that today um, taking place. Um, but this new reliance on a reduction in force means that we have to look at uh, containment. We have to look at making war unimaginable, as Eisenhower thought. You know, and part of that was um, a, a leaning on um, nuclear and atomic weapons. So we start to ramp up our production of of hydrogen bombs, of atomic bombs, but all in an effort to make war completely unimaginable uh, to wage. And if we go to the next slide. The generals, um, generals wanted their weapons um, and members of Congress wanted jobs for their constituents in their districts and the military industrial complex, those actually making the, um, making the goods making the weapons. Um, we're not fans of this outlook. Uh, generals like Eisenhower knew that they wanted the latest and greatest weapons, but that having those was just an, an opportunity. It was an open door for temptation. If we have them, people are going to want to use them. And over the next few years, he poured over budgets looking for uh, what he would consider unnecessary spending. And one of the remarks that he makes is that, you know, he's concerned that someday someone without any military experience like he has, like significant military experience, is going to be president of the United States, and they're going to know what can be cut from the Defense Department budget. Not that you know it should or shouldn't be cut, but what should be cut. And that kind of uh, sets his, his outlook and says, okay, well, we're going to cut some stuff from this budget, which he does quite successfully. Um, in December 1957, uh, late December of 1957, if we go to the next slide, Mark, um, a CIA estimate uh, was released in a, in a report saying that the Soviet unions were ahead of us on missile production. This is patently uh, not true. Um, and there's some speculation about who kind of facilitated that report being released to the public. Uh, it could have been displeased generals or other officials uh, within the CIA. Um, and the American public started to get a little antsy, as you can imagine, because here the Soviets are with all their missiles, and here we are perhaps a little bit behind. And it also has the added effect of firing up members of Congress, including a young senator, uh, John F. Kennedy, who had some political aspirations of his own. And Kennedy takes to the floor of the Senate and starts to hammer away on how old General Eisenhower let this happen. How could this have happened on, on General Eisenhower's watch? We must expand the Defense Department budget. And Ike is just, he is pretty cheesed about this development. And um, he has to take the hit because he knows that if he says, no, we're fine, someone's gonna ask the question, well, how many missiles do we have? And then if you ask that question, then you know, are we giving away a national security interest here if he answers how many missiles? So he takes the hit. Um, and then in 1958, here we have uh, Sputnik, um, the satellite that was launched by the Soviet Union. It went beep, beep around the globe. Uh, and the Senate 
in the wake of this, the Senate just totally uh, increases Defense Department spending. Um, and Eisenhower issues the statement that we should be mindful of useless things proposed in the name of national security. Um, and Ike reminds us that less spending on defense does not mean a weaker defense. Mark, can we go to the next slide, please? In 1961, Ike issues his farewell, um, where he, he reminds the American people that the US has become the strongest nation in the world, strong, not just in military might, but in how we use our power in the pursuit of global peace and human betterment. Um, he says, our arms must be mighty, however, to keep aggressors at bay. And while we need, and while we need, uh, need that for security, we must be watchful for the influence of that military industrial complex. Um, he says, this combination must not be allowed to quote, endanger our liberties or our, domestic, or our democratic processes only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery for defensive or for our def of defense, sorry, the mil military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that the security and liberty may prosper together. Ike then reminds the world that disarmament is key and that peace is in sight and that together we must learn how to compose differences uh, not with arms, but with intellect and a decent purpose. So some final thoughts about all this, as we it took a very quick adventure through Eisenhower and the military industrial complex, is that Eisenhower effort, Eisenhower's efforts, uh, although uh, not perfect, uh, did cool tensions between us and the Soviet Union. And although they were distrustful at the end of his, his tenure as president, they did start to warm up a little bit. Um, Ike saw past the trauma of, of Pearl Harbor and said, okay, if we're going to really prevent this, we must, must find a way uh, to, to get to disarmament. Um, and even though, uh, even in the face of aggressive Soviet Union um, making demands on Berlin, the crises in Hungary um, and in Poland and in the Middle East, Ike was unflagging in his support of his new look program. Um, so here are the Soviets kind of doing their thing and Eisenhower says, we have to stay the course if we're going to convince people that we're serious about disarmament and peace um, and global peace. And Eisenhower did work to keep uh, skittish Americans calm when the Soviet Union tested their rockets. He reminded Americans that the Soviets, um, remi reminded Americans and the Soviets that the free world was stronger than those aligning themselves with the Soviet Union and that we didn't have to spend as much on, uh, on our defensive weapons and our offensive weapons um, that, and that we were in a much better position than we thought we were in. And people trusted, most people trusted him um, in that area. And Ike's biggest fear was that in fighting uh, a global war, the worst, the worst thing than actually winning that global war or uh, fighting the global war was winning that global war because at the end of the day, that probably relied on the use of nuclear weapons if it was an all out open hostility. Um, he's perhaps one of the only people the American people would trust um, when he threatened or promised to use nuclear weapons if necessary while simultaneously working quite perhaps quietly to preserve the peace and to expand it to other nations, in particular the Soviet Union, um, and trying to get them to come along. And he did not mind spending what, uh, what political, um, political capital he had in that endeavor. And it's, a, it's uh, the final thought I have is, in researching this and learning about Eisenhower, um, he is an excellent reminder of how complex the world is and how complex these issues are that we face on a, a regular basis. Um, and it's perhaps a little serendipitous that we're talking about Eisenhower and the Cold War and the Soviet Union uh, with, with the way tensions are uh, globally right now. I think there's a lot to learn from him. Wow, well, thank you, Josh, um, for all of that. That was fantastic. I threw a lot of history at everybody just then. <laughs> you did, you did, but uh, we were ready for it uh, and we embraced it. Um, so thank you so much for that.
Um, I just want to uh, loop back to the Blackstone River Valley at this point. Um, we've talked about this evolution of industry and the military here in the Blackstone River Valley over time. We've talked about, you know, Ike's role in all of this and kind of how Ike uh, had certain uh, opinions about where military and industry would go. Um, today, uh, we've talked about these patterns, right, of industry in the Blackstone River Valley ramping up production just during wartime and then returning to their normal productions after war. Uh, and that is not what we see in industry today. There is still industry in the Blackstone River Valley um, that is producing goods for the U.S. military. And although we can argue whether or not we're actually at war or at not, certainly military men and women across the globe would argue that we are at war in certain parts of the world. Um, we are not in the midst of a declared war by Congress. And yet industry here in the Blackstone River Valley still relies on the military uh, as a huge part of what they are producing. Hope Global is a great example of that. They produce boot lace um, and parachute cords for the US military, as is the Northwest Woolen Mill up in uh, Woonsocket, where they produce berets for the US Army. Um, so something distinctly different than what we saw um, during uh, previous years and really kind of military and industry now being intertwined uh, more often than not. Josh, um, we are almost out of time, although Allison is on vacation this week. I promised her we would stay on time and on track. We do have time after to, you know, ask questions, um, have more discussion uh, later. But uh, kind of in conclusion, Josh, if I wanted to come and visit Eisenhower National Historic Site this summer, what are any helpful trips, uh, um, any helpful uh, tips, not trips, any helpful tips that you could provide us uh, if visiting Eisenhower? Yeah, absolutely. Check the website for our schedule. Uh, we start tours in April. It's three days a week, um, but then we expand that once we hit June 1st, uh, we are, we're running all the way through um, August, mid-August with a pretty robust schedule of, of programming, including house tours, walks around the grounds where rangers will talk about almost anything they're interested in that relates to Eisenhower, um, and we'll be giving uh, cemetery tours at Gettysburg National Cemetery about World War I veterans who are interred there. Um, from both the Pacific and European theaters. Um, there'll be um, some programs, uh, including um, a walk uh, in, the, in the footsteps of Camp Colt and young Captain Eisenhower at Gettysburg. So the visitors will have the opportunity to, to explore that as well. So come on out and visit us. Um, we're gonna, if you wanna drop the link in the chat to the, the schedule, I'm sure we can we can find that and drop that in there. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, to me at my email address, which we can drop in the chat as well. I'd be happy to, happy to talk to you about your visit and um, get it planned with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, and thank you all for joining us here for this uh, third um, discussion in our series next week. Um, same time, same night of the week, uh, next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we will be joined by Reconstruction Era National Historic Site. Um, so that'll be uh, another fascinating discussion, I'm sure. So we hope to see you then. For those of you interested in sticking around and having a, a more informal discussion, uh, we'll hang out for the next 15 minutes. But thank you all and have a great night.